Our next presenter is Kathleen Garland. Again, Kathy, well, she always agrees to help with Envirathon because she's a good friend. She is a senior lecturer in the School of Business and she teaches on all matters sustainability. Dr. Garland, if you could please take it from here. Well, thank you guys very much for allowing me to speak to you again. So I don't know that I'm going to take my full hour here, even though I'm covering a tremendous amount of material, as it turns out. <laughs> when I talked to Rowena about this, I said, you know, what would you like me to do? And she said, well, she told me what everybody else was covering. And it's like, okay, um, I'll just cover everything else <laughs> that isn't being covered. So I'm talking today about food systems, energy systems, and the built environment. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk about impacts of different elements of our food, energy, and built environments. I'm going to provide some resources at the end of each section that you can use for your students to look at some solutions to the kinds of challenges that we're seeing in terms of these systems. Uh, one of the first things I want to make clear, and, and hopefully my presentation will make that clear, is you know we tend to talk a lot about the impact of these systems and their contribution to climate change. And we tend to focus less on the impacts of climate change on these systems. However, it's a constant feedback loop. What we're doing impacts the climate, the change in the climate impacts what we can and what we are doing. And so while some of the things we may be doing in our food systems, in our built environment, in our energy systems is, is contributing to climate change, they're also suffering from it. And so I'm gonna talk in all cases about you know, what the impacts and the contributions of that system are to climate change. And then I'm going to turn around and talk about what effects that's having on that system. And in, sadly, in all cases, it tends to be negative unless we make it different. So that's, um, that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Food systems in the United States. We have a lot of different ones, uh, but one of the biggest ones that impacts us enormously in terms of our ability to feed our people uh, not just feed our people, but feed, feed people all over the world, is industrial mechanized agriculture. And when we talk about that, what we're talking about farming crops at an industrial scale. When it comes to the research in terms of impacts of food systems, most of that research does focus primarily on grain crops. We don't have a lot of data, or at least I haven't delved deeply into the literature on you know, what the impact of raising lettuce and tomatoes is on agriculture other than the water consumption that is associated with it. But in terms of being able to actually calculate how much greenhouse gas is being emitted by these different practices, the focus has been largely on croplands, mechanized cropland, uh, because they are by far the biggest contributor. So the data that I'm going to show you here and that we're going to talk about is primarily production of grains, corn, wheat, soybeans, millet, sometimes oil seeds, but those are really, you know, the top three is, is corn and wheat and soybeans. They are the three big grain production, three big food producer base crops that we have, that we produce a lot of in the United States. And right now, the agriculture is relying almost entirely on fossil fuels to produce everything it uses. And so we use me mechanized equipment. It runs on fossil fuels. We make the plants grow using chemical fertilizers, which are in many cases produced using fossil fuels or from fossil fuels. And we treat pests with pesticides. And again, those are generated from fossil fuels. So a very, very heavily fossil fuel dependent system and thus a very large producer of fuel related greenhouse gases. This system produces a lot. This is some data that shows you estimated U.S. greenhouse gas emission by economic se sector from the USDA in 2020. And you can see here that agriculture was producing 11%. And that has gone up. In about 2015, it was only 9%. So this has been going up over time. And you can see here that is related to basically four different areas of emissions. Surprisingly, I think a lot of people think we, again, it's all the, the emissions from our machinery, but the biggest contribution is direct nitrous oxide emissions from fertilizers and fertilizer use, and then some from tailpipe emissions of equipment, and then some of it from animal production as well. Um, we produce a lot of nitrous oxide, so it's not actually carbon dioxide that's being produced here. And then the second is direct methane production, and that is largely from the animal sector. 
and I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. But you can see that direct carbon dioxide, for example, coming from tailpipe emissions is less than 1%. And then um, emissions related to electricity uses on farms of different kinds is about half a percent. So we're talking most of this coming as nitrous oxide and direct methane in terms of the overall impact. So not nearly as much carbon dioxide as many other contributors to greenhouse gas emissions in the US. So while we are impacting the climate, changes in the climate are also drastically impacting our crop production. And again, there are many different kinds of impacts that we can have from climate change on how crops are produced. One of the biggest one, of course, is water resources. As the climate changes, rainfall patterns change. And those rainfall patterns change to make certain areas of the country wetter, other areas drier. Overall, we're looking at a generally an increase in temperature, which leads to greater evapotranspiration. And so, again, more water being taken out of the ground. We see that the growing seasons are changing in terms of their length, and generally they are getting longer. And then changing in climate means that, uh, you know, we, we may or may not have frost freeze impacts in areas that used to have them. And again, this is, is generally because things are warming overall, less of this kind of an impact. All of these changes impact what we grow and where we grow it. Crops, of course, are incredibly dependent on the amount of water that is provided to them. And so uh, availability of water resources determines whether or not we need to irrigate a crop. And irrigation, again, is a, is a large investment for a farmer. It's also a large demand on the water resource that may or may not be present or may or may not be present in large quantity in that region. Certain crop species are much more adaptable to changes in climate than others. And so what we can plant, you know, we talk, for example, about winter wheat, you know, as the climate warms, the areas where you can plant winter wheat tend to move northward because winter wheat is a winter crop and you need winter conditions to grow it. Other crops, again, become more viable as temperatures warm. Um, a lot of our grain crops, wheat especially, are more suited to our current northern areas of the country. And so as the temperature warms, um, the, the southern areas become less amenable to wheat growth and, and better for other kinds of, of crops. The other thing that maybe a lot of people don't think about, but changes in climate and changes in precipitation affect the soil loss in a region. Soil loss is a combination of agricultural practices, the type of soil that is being farmed, and then the agricultural method that's being used, and then the amount of wind and rain. Obviously, you have enough rain, you don't have nearly as much dust. Dust is a prime indicator that dust in the air means you're losing soil from the ground. And we are at a still losing soil in our agricultural belts at this in this country at a far too at an unsustainable rate. And so soil loss prevention is already an issue. It becomes aggravated by changes in climate. And then the last thing that changes as the climate changes is the presence and the type of pollinators and pests that are out there. When you don't have a frost or a freeze anymore, certain kind of pests are going to winter over and proliferate. But that's also true for some of your pollinators. So pollinators and pests are also sensitive to temperature change, length of day, amount of water availability, and of course the types of plants and the types of predators that are out there. So their food source and their predators are changing. So we have all of these different kinds of changes that are taking place because of climate change that then affect our industrial agricultural system as well. So there's this constant interaction between change and then the production of greenhouse gases by the process that impacts and, and increases that change over time. It's a pretty complicated feedback loop that we're dealing with in the food system. There are a lot of strategies out there. People are talking about this because of course food is very important to all of us. And so I wanted to show you some websites here that have some different kinds of projects that are going on. Uh, this first one goes to the World Bank. This is Climate Smart Agricultural Projects from the World Bank. These are projects all over the world and they emphasize the interaction of cropland management, livestock management, and forest and fishery management as a system that helps to make all of those systems more resilient to climate change. And this particular website has a lot of resources um, that students can use. There are profiles of different countries, the future of food. There are just lots of information here from the World Bank. 
and they particularly focus on, on ways to increase productivity from existing lands, making those lands more resilient, and then reducing overall emissions. So those are the elements of climate smart agriculture that the World Bank emphasizes. And then they basically have some projects that we can look at down here from different parts of the world that they are managing. So some examples in Bangladesh, overall reducing the intensity of emissions, helping farmers learn how to feed their animals better, how to do breeding and manure management. So again, these are, this tends to be animal focused. We'll talk a little bit more about animals in a minute, but in Bangladesh, livestock farmers are a great contributor to the nutritional system as well as to their agricultural economic sector. China, uh, interesting, almost a billion dollars supporting water efficient farmland use, improving soil conditions, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions overall, and also increasing soil carbon sequestration. So there are lots of projects that are, again, looking at this interaction between climate change and agricultural processes to mitigate the emissions at the same time increasing production. I like this one in Uruguay because I think it's important. They're actually creating a, an agricultural information and decision support system, a way for farmers to learn what kinds of methods are best for them. Because every farm is different. Every farmer has different needs. And having some sort of a decision-making framework to help people make those decisions is a very important element of improving production, especially for smaller holders, which in, you know, are not such a big part of the United States agriculture, but which are a huge part of the rest of the world in this time. Brazil, uh, many of us are familiar with the fact that a tremendous amount of Brazilian forest has been converted to agricultural use. And Brazil is quite aware of that too. They are working on improving agricultural production and using low ag carbon agriculture on those areas that have been converted to agricultural use in recent times. And then Colombia's again, focusing on sustainable cattle ranching. This particular project doesn't give us the details of exactly what we're doing. We have to go out there and read it, but they're increasing their dairy production significantly using sustainable cattle ranching practices. So again, lots of different kinds of projects going on with the World Bank. I like Yemen is focused on reducing the impacts of the desert locust, which is a pest which, again, becomes more significant for people as climate changes. I like this one, too. Uzbekistan, they have a primarily cotton and wheat monoculture. They're moving to a more diverse farming system in order to make it more resilient to climate. So, again, many different projects available here from the World Bank. So they're a good one. The USDA focuses a lot on practices that people can use here. There are a number of them that are very strongly in vogue, if you like, for getting farmers to do this. And some of those are conservation tillage, residue management, and planting cover crops. And so this is actually a great publication here. This is the Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education Organization. And they have some really nice information here about how people can implement these types of practices on their farm. You know, a nice short video um, that shows a farmer what we're talking about, stories about what farmers are doing, and then, you know, basically a table of contents where you can look at cover crops and what a cover crop is and how that works. And again, I'm, I'm kind of assuming you guys know what cover crops are. Cover crop is just simply planting a crop on the land that keeps the soil covered so that it doesn't lose moisture and soil when it is in between the primary crop that it's being used for. Conservation tillage, also sometimes called no-till farming, is a big method. Been around for decades, but it's being promoted heavily, again, in order to reduce the amount of time soil is exposed to the atmosphere and thus reduce dust production, maintain soil health, reduce soil temperature, retain water in the soil. All of those things make the field more resilient to climate change and at the same time help the field not produce nitrous oxide from fertilizers and dust and contribute. And again, again, one pass tillage where you have one piece of equipment that comes through and does multiple processes. So it might plant the seed, fertilize the seed at the same time so that you don't have to move your tractor through the field twice. Um, you plant and fertilize at the same time, one, one pass through the field, reduces the amount of compaction on the soil, reduces the dust, increases the, the soil health over time. There's ecological pest management. Again, sustainable grazing is here. Um, lots of information on this website to help people understand what they can do 
to make the agriculture, their agricultural facility, both more climate friendly and more sustainable as climate changes and more resilient to it. Lastly, regenerative agriculture is a big name in the news these days. Um, regenerative agriculture is the idea that we create by doing agriculture, we actually create better soil. So not only do we not damage it, but we actually holistically manage our agricultural areas to improve soil over time and to create soil over time. This is a blog page from the American Farmland Trust. I don't always like to share blogs because sometimes they're pretty political. This one is not. I like what they have to say here. They really talk about the scientific, as they say here, scientific, economic, and social reasons why regenerative agriculture needs to be part of the solution to make our agricultural lands more climate resilient and climate friendly. They talk in this particular blog about the different, how you make agricultural production of crops and animals work better together, what regenerative practices look like at the industrial scale versus what they look like at the individual small farm scale. Lots of information here on this website to read in their blogs about the science and, and how farmers can work together with agencies and with everybody else who's involved in, in agricultural production to make regenerative agriculture more a part of the current agricultural landscape. This is a very interesting report that I wanted to show you. What this particular slide shows you is a report that was done in 2015 on the adaptation in the U.S. field crop sector to climate change in terms of water scarcity and temperature change. And this little graph right up here at the top right here shows you the expected change in our ability to produce certain crops up until 2080 based on climate change and water scarcity and water availability. And what you will see is that in all cases except for wheat, we're expecting that climate change will decrease our production of these various grain crops. The one that suffers the most is oats with an expected 20% decrease in production by the year 2080. Corn also suffers quite a bit. Sorghum and soybeans don't do as well. They are down. And then again, we find that barley rises. Cotton is down a bit. Rice is uh, again in the single digits. And then wheat actually improves its production over time as water demand changes. The other really interesting finding is down here. And I know that you cannot see the details here, but what I want you to do is look at this little line, this little green line here. And that is the estimated need to irrigate. In other words, that's the estimated extent of acreage that will be under supplemental irrigation coming up toward 2080. And we actually see that that decreases a little bit, which is really kind of good news for us, if this model has any validity, that we will in the future need to irrigate less land, um, which is, a good, is good news in terms of the amount of water that then is available for other uses. We have to remember that these scenarios are all taking place in a world of increasing population. And so, unfortunately, a decrease in food crops is bad news in those terms, but a decrease in use of water for agriculture is good news. Just a very interesting study I wanted to show you because the data is quite interesting from it in terms of what's going to happen in the future. Let's talk a little bit about animal production. Concentrated animal feeding operations are the primary source of greenhouse gases. Although individual cows do produce a lot of them, but when you, of course, concentrated animal feeding operations mean you have very many thousands of cows concentrated in a small area, which means you get these concentrated plumes of greenhouse gases being generated. And about 50% of the total greenhouse gas emissions coming from agriculture do come from animal production. So about 50% to crops, about 50% is coming from animal production. The primary sources of greenhouse gas production from animal production, first of all, enteric methane, which is gut produced primarily in the guts of cows. Cows burp out between 30 and 50 liters of methane every day. Um, and depending on what you feed them, they burp a lot more of that. So gut produced methane is a, it's, and you know, people out there want to say, well, no, it's, it's cow farts, but it's not, it's burps. And this has been studied and shown. So cows burp a lot of methane. The second source is the manure management systems. Right now, the only thing required on concentrated operations is a manure pond. Manure ponds generate both methane and nitrous oxide. So these manure ponds are, along with a lot of sulfur gases, 
So they're stinky emission ridden systems, and they're the only thing required for managing manure at these sites right now. The last impact is from land application of that manure. Once a pond has been in use for a while, we dredge out the solids and we often use them in land application. Again, that can be another source of methane, but primarily a source of more NOx and primarily nitrous oxide. So um, animal production produces a lot of greenhouse gases, no question. The animals themselves are less susceptible to impacts of climate change unless you're in the dairy industry. Dairy cattle tend to be very sensitive to thermal stress. Um, And so rising temperatures and greater humidity causes them to reduce their milk production and reduce their just their ability to lactate, increases issues with their rumen health. So it increases digestive upsets for them, increases their emissions of both greenhouse gases and simply their susceptibility to infection. And it can also cause them to have difficulty conceiving. And of course, if you don't, if your dairy cows aren't conceiving calves, they will not be giving milk for you. There's a direct relationship between thermal sensitivity and keeping your cows comfortable and having them be able to have the calves, which then allow them to produce the milk that you want to produce. One of the primary ways that we are trying to reduce animal production impacts, let's say in terms of our manure treatment, is um, are something called anaerobic biodigesters. And anaerobic biodigesters convert manure to energy. EPA has this great little website here for farmers so they can decide whether or not an anaerobic biodigester is right for you. A biodigester is simply a covered pond. And that pond is, um, again, it's fully covered. Its oxygen is depleted underneath the cover. Um, You get anaerobic digestion and you produce methane. When the methane is produced, it can then be cleaned and used for an energy source on the farm. What you wind up at the end, again, is a manure, is a sludge that can be used, again, as fertilizer. So they're really popular. They're really expensive. They are, again, a fairly new technology. Costs about a million dollars to put one in. So it has to be a fairly big farm or they have to have a pretty good credit rating in order to get the the loan to do them. But they do produce quite a lot of energy. And that energy can be used on the farm. It can even be sold. So it's a biogas. These are biogas projects for larger animal production facilities. It sure beats having a a stinky pond out there that's generating greenhouse gases. And you can see here, this is about the cutoff, uh, 500 head of cattle, 2,000 hogs, or maybe 5,000 hogs, depending on the kind of manure management system you have. Um, And so 500 is not all that many. Uh, Most Concentrated animal feeding operations are handling thousands of animals. So this is, it's actually practical for quite a few different kinds of operations. And again, they tell you what kind of manure is best to be used in this sort of a system. Again, lots of information out here to help farmers decide if they can put in anaerobic biodigesters to help them reduce the greenhouse gas impacts of manure and better manage their manure. In terms of cutting our cows to burp less, There is a lot of information out here on how to reduce enteric methane by feeding our cows different stuff. This is from Australia. On using feed additives to reduce gut methane from cows. Cows, as I said, they generate a whole lot of it. In Australia, that's interesting. Um, The direct livestock emissions account for about 70% of their greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, as well as 11% of their total national greenhouse gas emissions, much like us, so it's very similar. Um, There's some information here for your students about how methane is generated in in stomachs, but there are basically three different areas or types of supplements we can feed. There are synthetic chemicals, of course, you know, the pharmaceutical industry has produced some nice additives, which are supposed to help cows be less gassy, but there are also some great natural supplements. We're actually doing a little experiment here at UHL campus on feeding seaweed to cows because it's been showed that a very small seaweed supplement, basically a four to eight ounce supplement in a day's feeding and cows eat a tremendous amount of food in a day, a small percentage of that uh, seaweed uh, significantly reduces gut methane generation for them. Um, And gut methane generation is really an indication of rumen health. A healthy rumen doesn't produce nearly as much methane as the rumen of a cow that's being fed grain, for example. Cows on concentrated animal feeding operations, particularly for beef, are fed grain in order to fatten them quickly. At the it's what they call finishing, and at that time they also feed them. They feed them a lot of antibiotics because cows are not meant to eat grain; they're meant to eat roughage. So, adding seaweed and tannins or other additives to their diet during that time 
can uh, significantly reduce the methane they produce because it improves their gut health while they're being fed this sort of food. And then it turns out that fats and oils, so basically having omega-3s and fats put into their diet also helps with reducing gut methane. This is an interesting uh, result down here. It says feeding one, one type of seaweed to cattle, and that's a, a seaweed called brown seaweed, it has reduced in 3% of the diet load to the cow has resulted up to 80% reduction in methane emissions from cattle in one of the studies that has been done. Now, different studies have had different results, but that certainly indicates that feeding seaweed, and we do have a lot of seaweed. Um, it's fairly easy to harvest. You can actually buy it commercially now to feed as a feed supplement to reduce enteric methane from cattle. So there is a question from Kim. She says, when you say roughage, what are you talking about? Ah, roughage is cellulose, grass, silage, hay. It's fiber. For us, roughage is things like spinach and oatmeal. Uh, but for cows, it's grass, silage, hay, stuff that has lots and lots of fiber. And cows are grazers. That's usually what they're eating, right? They're out there eating grass, plants, weeds, some tree material. They eat tons of fiber. When we feed them grain, we take that fiber element out of their diet. Cows are ruminants. That rumen is designed to take this roughage in. Cows just sort of, they don't actually chew their food. They sort of bite it off and swallow it. And do they also have oils in them? Yes. Natural ones do tend to have more oil in them than what we feed them artificially. So they do have some. But the primary thing is there's a lot of fiber in there. Cows, you know, ingest the fiber. It goes into the rumen. A cow spends about four to six hours a day grazing, and then they'll spend a whole lot more time laying around, chewing their cud, ruminating. And what they're actually doing is they're actually regurgitating this fiber from their rumen, and they're chewing it in their mouths, and then it goes into the next stomach, it goes into their, what's called their abomasum, where it's digested more normally. So they chew the roughage, their saliva helps to modify it, and then it goes into their sort of more what we would think of the more typical digestive system that we have. But then the rumen, that's where all the roughage is living. And when you take away the roughage, the rumen doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And it's very susceptible to antibiotic. So one of the reasons the last solution here is to grass feed cattle rather than putting them onto concentrated animal feeding operations is because that keeps them in the natural system eating the way they're supposed to eat. And they're much healthier. They produce a lot less methane. You don't have to feed them antibiotics. However, the, we cannot meet the beef demand, for example, in the United States using just grass-fed cattle. There just isn't enough ranch land available because we're huge beef eaters. So there's a subtext here that I didn't add, but in terms of climate resilience of our animal production system, a change in human diet is going to be necessary for us. We're going to have to shift away from as much meat in our diet if we want to change our agricultural system to produce less greenhouse gases from cattle. Right now, we're really super dependent on the concentrated animal feeding operations, which then produce a lot of methane. And if any of you have tried to buy grass-fed beef, you can, and it's really expensive. Fisheries. Fisheries are also impacted by climate change. And there's not a lot we can do about it, except measure it. Um, so I only have one slide here to talk to you about fisheries. This is a study of three fish and shellfish species on the Northeast coast of the United States. The change in their habitat location between 1968 and 2015, the American lobster, something we all love and which is iconic, the red hake and the black sea bass. And what you see down here at the right, you can see that they are gradually moving northward um, over time. And so you can see that the occurrence of black sea bass has moved north between 150 and 200 miles. The red hake has been moving northward from between, again, but around 100 miles. And then the American lobster has moved north about 150 miles as well. So we have this change in the movement. Now, the American lobster is most commonly found up in this area anyway, but you can see from the distribution of dots here that over time you're getting greater concentration slightly to the north. The black sea bass, you can see quite a distinctive change in its occurrence over time. And then the red hake, again, you can see that it's the blue, it's moving north quite a bit. So we're seeing northward migration of fisheries. Another serious issue is ocean acidification, which poses a risk to shellfish because it causes them to not be able to deposit their shells. 
this particular graph uh, comes from this website. This is just a reference from, from where this particular article comes from. So if you need to go look at the article, you can. So again, changes in fisheries are happening. These are wild systems. There's not a lot we can do about this, except stop changing the climate. Energy systems. Climate impacts of energy systems. These are the ones we tend to think of most. We tend to think of electricity production, fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas, producing a lot of greenhouse gases, a lot of carbon dioxide. However, those are not the only places that our energy systems impact the climate. So it's not just an energy production. This is a really nice little website here from the Energy Information Agency at the United States government. Basic information on where greenhouse gases come from, what they are and how they're produced, what they produce. It. And so sector is very important. This graph is a key one for us to understand fossil fuel combustion of both transportation and energy production is the primary source of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. And then you can see, and carbon dioxide is the big one. So CO2 from fossil fuel combustion, then we have methane, we have nitrous oxides, we have these very high greenhouse gas potential gases that are very small numbers. They're listed a little bit higher here. And then just other forms of carbon dioxide. So fossil fuel combustion, the energy connection is that most of our energy is produced using natural gas, petroleum, or coal. So we're using a lot of that to generate energy, uh, to generate electricity, um, but we also use it directly in transportation. This is our consumption. And again, you can see that our carbon dioxide emissions are coming from, again, petroleum and natural gas and then coal, because uh, an interesting coal produces more carbon dioxide than, you know, it produces 11% of the energy, but it produces 21% of the emissions. So coal is a very high source of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions. Natural gas, you know, about the same, 34% of our energy is used as natural gas, 34% of the emissions are 34 are the same. And then petroleum, again, petroleum, we use about 36% uh, of it to generate energy for us, but it puts out more, puts out about 46% of our emissions. So our energy systems are highly dependent on fossil fuels. That's where a lot of this is coming from. Transportation actually produces most of that energy use. So it's not electricity production, but it's transportation consumes a lot of petroleum, much less natural gas or coal. Uh, and then, of course, electricity generation combines a lot of natural gas and a lot of coal. We have a lot of stuff coming out. And again, this is a great website for your students to take a look at and, and see how the energy industry is producing, using energy and, in other words, using, using fuels to produce energy and producing emissions from that production. Renewables and nuclear, although we talk about them as being zero emission, they also have a carbon footprint. Um, we tend to think, well, renewables are the answer. Let's go to wind, let's go to solar, let's go to nuclear. We won't make any emissions. We'll solve the climate problem. Well, yes, my, we will help, but they still have a, a carbon footprint and some of them have a really significant carbon footprint in terms of manufacturing the equipment and the materials needed to collect the energy. So if you're making solar panels, you need silicon. If you're making wind turbines, you need a lot of aluminum you are doing nuclear, you've got to mine uranium and resource extraction as an industry has a lot of climate impacts, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, as well as a lot of other types of environmental impacts that have to be dealt with. So there's a large carbon footprint and a large environmental footprint in the manufacturing of these kinds of, of systems. We don't want to forget about it. There's also the carbon footprint of manufacturing the equipment. So, you know, manufacturing wind turbines, manufacturing solar panels, building nuclear plants, um, lots of carbon footprint generated there, and then just transporting the materials. So you've got to get the resources to the sites, you've got to get the raw materials to the manufacturing. So there's still a transportation impact. So again, while renewables and nuclear have a low carbon footprint, they're not zero. And again, their use as energy production is zero emission, but they are not zero carbon footprint sources. And it's important to remember that. The impacts of climate on energy systems is basically a field of study in itself. The research here is all based on very complex modeling. It's the interaction of extreme weather, changing patterns of energy consumption due to climate changes, 
population growth and migration affects how and what kinds of energy systems are where the demand is. The availability of water affects this. So this is, I don't have an answer for you guys here. The impacts, the feedback loops between energy systems and climate impacts is just incredible. It's very complicated. We don't have a lot of, there are hundreds <laughs> doing the research on this particular topic for this presentation. All I kept coming up with was literature reviews of the 200 different studies that had been, which all had competing, conflicting conclusions on what the impacts are of climate on energy and how those impacts are going to manifest themselves. So this is a, an extremely complicated relationship. And that's about all I can say about it for you in terms of suitability for Envirothon. We know that there are relationships and we have many anecdotal ones. In fact, I got the, uh, let me see if I can bring this up here on, on the web for us. This is something I just saw this morning, but let me see if I can get Space City weather up here because they had a great blog this morning. And I think it should come up for me. And yep, this graph right here, this picture right here, and I think I can make this biggest, bigger for us. This was in their blog this morning. And this is information on the F3 tornado that came through our region last week. And the photo that I specifically want you to look at is this one down here on the right, because this is fallen high voltage towers, which of course is critical to the climate resilience of our energy grid. These gray streaks you have are actually burn marks uh, when the towers came down and dropped the wires onto the ground and it, it literally burnt the ground. But there's a tower laying here. I think there's one, parts of one might be over here. There's another streak back here. So our energy systems are extremely vulnerable to extreme weather systems, but they're also, as we've seen in freezes and hot conditions, they're vulnerable to extremes of heat and cold. Um, and that's just the grid. The production systems are susceptible. They all demand water. The water availability varies with the climate. So, you know, we have just such a complicated picture in terms of how energy systems and, and energy production is related to what's happening with the climate. Fortunately, our systems are as adaptable as we are, and we can make them both more resilient and more adaptable by better planning. But we don't have a really good picture right now. We don't have really good data that tells us how, you know, these sorts of things are going to happen. One of my friends has a, a solar on his roof, and he said, it's rated to a category three hurricane, but they didn't say anything about tornadoes. And he lives in Friendswood, and, and two neighborhoods away, people got hit by that tornado in Friendswood. So these kinds of systems, both locally and on a larger scale, are really challenging. Um, last thing I wanted to talk about, and this should segue into our next presenter, are the climate impacts of buildings. Buildings account for a tremendous amount of energy use. 36% globally of all energy is used by buildings. And therefore, a tremendous amount of energy and process-related CO2 emissions are related to those buildings. 39% of all CO2 emissions in the world are related to buildings. And that includes, and 11% of those emissions come from manufacturing the building materials, such as glass, steel, concrete, lots and lots of impacts to build the built environment that we live in. So really a big consumer of energy and a big producer of emissions. Climate has a lot of impacts on the built environment. We have, as we've just seen, stress and damage to infrastructure from heat, from cold, from severe weather. Um, we have the urban heat island impact, which is affecting the quality of life in cities. Climate impacts logistics, how to move goods and distribute, distribute goods from here to there. I mean, we certainly saw that during the pandemic, which was only tangentially a climate impact, but certainly every time there's a hurricane or a major weather event or we have flooding, it impacts our ability to get things where we want them to go. Climate impacts the air and water quality. As we know firsthand, you know, ozone production in the city of Houston is completely related to our climate. On high heat and humidity days, we get a lot more ozone produced, but water quality as well. Changes in the amount of rainfall, changes in the amount of runoff, changes in the way we manage that runoff and that water affects our water quality, um, which again, directly affects us as users of that water. And then the last thing that is really important is that climate impacts on the built environment tend to have very strong environmental justice implications. Problems like the ones listed here, stress and damage to infrastructure, urban heat islands, 
distribution of goods and air and water quality tend to disproportionately affect lower income and minority communities the most. Uh, people who don't have air conditioning, people who don't have cars to go and get things, people who can't afford to treat their water um, or to put air purifiers in their home, people who can't afford to maintain their homes from damage from freezing and heat and drought. Those are the kinds of people who are most affected. And the next presentation is a conversation about environmental justice. So the built environment really feeds into, uh, and climate impacts on the built environment really feed into issues around environmental justice. There are ways to reduce some of those climate impacts. Obviously changing our energy sources, using more renewable energy helps going to high density development instead of urban sprawl, moving toward mass transit, as opposed to individual cars on all these highways, which create tremendous amount of impervious surface, which reduces the water inflow to our subsurface. But also buildings themselves can be used. Building buildings which actually act as energy sources instead of energy sinks, which can purify their own water rather than using water and, and burdening our water purification systems, using buildings to actually catch water and grow crops with them, on them, and in them. There are many, many ways for us to make buildings that can help our urban areas and our buildings be more climate friendly. And I included this little blog here from Gensler. Again, a uh, conversation about how we can change the way we build in order to modify the climate impacts of that built environment. And I like this one. This is the Upcycle Created a Warehouse. They reuse 95% of their building materials to create a wonderful work site, workplace. And of course, Upcycle is a sustainability company. So you can do things really creatively. And you can basically tell just by looking at this, that these are all reused materials that they've used to, to build this building. There's a lot of information on this website, conversations about how the form of a building and the location of a building can make it more or less climate friendly conversations about how to reduce energy consumption policies, sustainability policies around the world and how they affect the built environment, how we can make our buildings smarter and make them more responsive, and then ways to reduce the carbon impact of how we build the buildings, the materials that we use, and how they embody not only carbon, but water uh, in terms of using better materials, which have less impact. And then finally, building reuse. Um, and I like this too. Again, you can look at this. It's small here, but you can check it out. How buildings can be adapted to new uses, when it's better to take an existing building and adapt it rather than building a new building. And, and if you build a new building, you know what you need to look at to make that decision. Uh, buildings, again, huge impacts on the, again, let me go back to the last slide, huge impacts on the amount of energy and the amount of emissions, also hugely impacted by climate change um, lots of ways that we can manipulate the, the urban environment and the built environment to reduce its impact and make it actually beneficial for improving the climate in the area where it's located. Going back to beef production, what percentage of the beef production in the US is actually grazed beef? I mean, for, from the beginning of their life through to the end of their life, wholly grazed beef. Do you, do you know that? I don't know that, that stat offhand. Um, it's probably pretty easy to get, but I would guess it's less than 10%. Okay. It's low. Because I do notice some of our grass-fed beef is actually imported from Australia, which seems counterintuitive if you're wanting to reduce <laughs> carbon emissions. <laughs> exactly. You want to reduce carbon emissions, then don't transport it from halfway around the world. Yeah. Um, but interestingly enough, you know, we are working here for our seaweed project. We're actually working with grass-fed beef. And we're working with the Law Ranch, which is up in Northeast Houston. They sell their grass feed beef over here at the farmer's market. Yes. And they sell right here. So he's been in the business for 30 years. Wow. So he's been doing grass fed beef and his father before him. So he's uh, got a long history with it. I have a question on the grass fed seaweed beef. So do we know anything about the taste? Because some people don't like the taste of grass-fed beef to begin with. Does the seaweed, and since I guess the beef changes flavor based off of what they eat too, I think a little bit, does the seaweed taste make the beef taste any different? No, it doesn't. It's such a small portion that it doesn't. Most of the studies, well, not all of them, but a number of the studies have been done on feeding seaweed to dairy cattle because they're confined and it's easier to do it. 
And a lot of the organic milk producers in the Northeastern United States now use a seaweed supplement as part of their milk production. And the only real issue has been increase of iodine in the milk because seaweed has a lot of iodine in it. And so they've been working on ways to reduce the iodine content of the seaweed so that the cows don't put a lot of iodine in their milk and people have a lot of, uh, you know, get extra iodine. In. Now, a little iodine is good for you, but not too much. So um, the only issue that's really out there about contributions to the food chain from seaweed is iodine, not flavor. So the milk doesn't taste fishy <laughs> and the beef doesn't taste fishy either. The seaweed is, is actually harvested and it's washed and cleaned and ground up. And so seaweed, you know, if you've eaten sushi, you've eaten seaweed, it's more spinachy flavored. And since cows eat a lot of grass, it's very, they eat a lot of flavor herbs in their grass diet anyway, it doesn't really change it. Can the seaweed fed cattle be called grass fed or would it be called <laughs> seaweed fed? <laughs> well, I think that given the fact that their diet is like 75 pounds of grass and four ounces of seaweed per day, I think we can still call them grass fed. Okay. And then the other question I had was, since not all cattle are near the ocean, would there be a greater carbon footprint by getting that seaweed to the cattle? And I, I think the answer there is yes. I mean, currently you can go to the feed store and buy it. Um, so it's actually collected in different parts of the country, transported and sold to feed stores. So it's harvested and being used as with any other supplement. Yes, you would be having some carbon footprint associated with the transportation of those materials to get them to the cows, because they're certainly not getting it off the land. And you can't let them go graze on the beach. They will die from the salt. So <laughs> they, can't, they can't eat raw seaweed. They might want to, but you can't let them because I mean, they would probably love it because it's very salty, but you literally could probably salt them to death. So you have to be careful because okay. they like salt. So you have to be careful with their salt consumption. So would there be maybe a little give and take since it produces less burping? <laughs> um, would that maybe that uh, counteract the carbon footprint of transportation maybe? Well, the key is that the carbon footprint of transportation is largely CO2, whereas the carbon footprint of cows is largely methane. And methane is about 25 times as effective a greenhouse gas as, as CO2. Good point. So I think the trade-off is pretty good, especially since you need so little of it. I think the trade-off is still carbon positive, or I would say, yeah, carbon beneficial. I'm not yeah. sure if that's carbon positive or carbon negative. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No, that's great answers. <laughs> Well, thank you all. I'm going to turn off my voice here and I'm going to listen to the next presentation. I'm really looking forward to hearing this one.